Good morning. Uh, this is the Vermont House Human Services Committee, and it is Wednesday, uh, April 28th. And the, for the first part of our morning, for about the next hour, hour and a half, um, whatever we are um, going to be focused on uh, JRH6, which is um, a resolution being treated as a bill uh, that indicates that uh, racism is a public health emergency. And this morning we um, have uh, Bo Yang, um, um, the human rights uh, um, person for the state. And we have um, Case Long, who um, is a Vermonter who ran uh, for the Chittenden County Senate. And uh, you're a realtor, if I recall. Yes, um, that's great. And uh, looking forward to the um, hearing from both of you. And uh, so if we can start with um, Boar and uh, just so that folks who are um, on YouTube uh, can follow us um, on our uh, committee webpage is one, a source list for the um, different resolution, the different um, whereas is in the resolution. Um, and there also is um, a, a case uh, provided some um, testimony or provided um, some information to Representative Rosenquist um, on comments on the bill that uh, Representative Rosenquist shared with us. And so that is on there as well. Um, good morning, Boar, good morning. Good morning. Thank you for having me here today. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces and I think a few new ones and um, that's wonderful. So I wanted to just kind of introduce myself because I think this is actually my first time in this committee this session. Uh, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Bohr and I am the executive director and legal counsel for the Vermont Human Rights Commission, which is Vermont state agency that enforces the anti-discrimination laws of the state in three primary areas, housing, places of public accommodations and in state government employment. And places of public accommodations is hospitals, roads, police, uh, prisons, so it, it means a lot, uh, all, all places really, that provides any sort of services and benefits to members of the general public. And to sort of uh, provide my testimony today for some of us who are also not just auditory learners, but visual learners, I created a quick PowerPoint, which might give us a nice little break from listening to people and looking at faces all day. I appreciate it. Um, especially during these times. So I'm gonna share my screen. Do you all see that? Okay. Yes. Um, okay, so obviously we're here today to talk about racism and declaring it as a public health emergency or a crisis. Uh, the mission of the Human Rights Commission is to promote full civil and human rights in Vermont. And the commission, again, protects people from unlawful discrimination in those three areas that I talked about by enforcing the anti-discrimination laws of the state. The ultimate goal of the Human Rights Commission is really to eradicate discrimination in all forms across all systems. But Fighting racism and other forms of discrimination one case at a time is a necessary but really inefficient way to mitigate and eradicate discrimination. And I wanted to demonstrate that by talking about both the federal and Vermont's fair housing laws, which are probably the most comprehensive and most protective anti-discrimination laws um, that we have. And yet, we know that housing discrimination remains prevalent in the state. Uh, testing results from Vermont Legal Aid tells us that housing providers in Vermont generally disfavor African-American renters, renters of foreign origin, renters with children, and renters with disabilities. In fact, in 44% of the tests, housing providers demonstrated either preferential treatment 
or the housing providers events unambiguous discrimination. National origin discrimination occurred almost 48% of the time. And what they found was that discrimination was subtle. Housing providers displayed polite and courteous demeanor. Uh, they often shook people's hands and smiled. And subject testers walked away and control testers walked away without sort of feeling any sense of animus or hate. Housing providers shared information with white tester of US origin about other available units when the testers price range uh, within the tester's price range if the unit was no longer available, but might fail to share any information or shared only limited information about units outside the tester's price range to a subject tester. Housing providers were more likely to follow up with control testers than subject testers, even when the subject testers called to share that they were still interested in the units. Many of the subject testers believed that the units had been rented and no discrimination had occurred when in fact the units were still available and offered to control testers. Similarly, African-American subject testers were less likely to be told about other available units and were asked questions about household composition and their employment much more often compared to their white control testers. Why is housing discrimination so prevalent when we have such a huge body of law that prohibits discrimination from occurring, both federally and at the state level. Because in Vermont, people rent and sell through word of mouth and homeowners are still predominantly white and more affluent. Because affordable housing is scarce and there is a tough competition for housing, people are more likely to tolerate discrimination and less likely to report housing discrimination for fear of losing their housing and because implicit and explicit biases persist. An example of this is looking at our history and the connection between systemic racism in housing, individual racism, and implicit biases. So we know that white people and black people had actually started to live in integrated housing um, in the 50s, except that civilian public housing programs demolished some of those integrated housing to develop segregated housing. The federal government then subsidized suburban housing development on the condition that those homes be sold only to white people and that the deeds of those homes the prohibited the resale to black people. And there were many, many zoning laws which made black parts of towns, um, industrial plants, waste and toxic use, while the same was not true of white neighborhoods. As a result of that, black neighborhoods became known as slums. White people then developed the belief that black people did not care for their homes and communities. And today, we see through testing that real estate agents and rental housing providers still show fewer available homes and apartments to black people. The fair housing laws did not address past discrimination. Homes with restricted covenants continued to be sold to white families for generations thereafter. And those homes increased substantially in value and equity. Today, black people, as well as other people of color, as well as LGBTQ people, as well as people with disabilities, really still experience employment discrimination. We know statistically that black income is approximately only 60% of white income. And what is more devastating is that black wealth is only five to 7% of white wealth. So what, is, what does all of that mean? Uh, well, housing is connected to education, housing is connected to transportation, housing is connected to where we work, and housing is also connect connected to our healthcare and our healthcare systems and access to healthcare. The reality is, is that if we're really going to eradicate uh, discrimination, it's gonna take a roadmap that kind of looks like this picture, where it all paths sort of converge and work together. At the end of the day, this is a really great quote from Dr. Uh, Georges Benjamin, who's the executive director of the American Public Health Association. He says, at the end of the day, racism impacts our health, your health. Poor housing, lead exposure, injury, poor schools. We know that high school graduation is a determinative of health. We know that women who have a higher education, their children are much more likely to live beyond their first year of life. 
a range of things from social determinants of health that make an enormous difference. So what is in a, a public health emergency? What does that even mean uh, when we talk about a public health emergency or a public health crisis? A public health crisis or emergency is something that impedes individuals and communities from being healthy. We know that discrimination is deadly. Dr. April Joy Damien, the Associate Director of the Weizmann Institute says that the turning point of a disease when an important change takes place, um, indicating either recovery or death. A crisis signals a critical inflection point that is a matter of life or death. It is abundantly clear in the US that racism is lethal to black Americans, to indigenous people, Latinos, Hispanics, and other people of color. And Dr. Mary Bassett, the professor of the practice of health and human rights at Harvard says, there has never been a time, not a single year, where the United States population of African descent hasn't been sicker or died younger than whites. Racism contributes to shorter life expectancy and poor overall health. Here's some important data that I thought would be important to kind of review today. People from ethnic and racial minority groups are at greater risk of getting COVID-19 and of dying from it. As of late July, Black people who make up just 13% of the US population accounted for a quarter of COVID-19 deaths, according to an article um, in the Harvard Medicine. Medical researchers at, at um, Harvard also said that healthcare workers of color were more likely to care for patients with suspected or confirmed COVID-19. They were more likely to report using inadequate protective gear and nearly twice as likely as white colleagues to test positive for the um, virus. According to the CDC, there was a 16% difference in the mortality rates of blacks versus whites across all ages and causes of death. In real world terms, the disparities can mean that black Americans in some cases have more than a decade shorter life expectancy than whites. And in places such as Milwaukee, which recently declared racism a public health crisis, a black resident's life expectancy was on average 14 years shorter than a white resident living in the same city. Racial and ethnic minorities throughout the United States experience higher rates of illnesses and death across health conditions such as diabetes, hypertension, asthma, heart disease, obesity, when compared to their white counterparts. So the impact of declaring racism a public health crisis or a public health emergency, it isn't just performa, it isn't just renaming it, but it actually has a real substantial value and meaning. And I thought that a really good example of this is looking at smoking and the results of declaring smoking a public health crisis. We know how many people smoke now by sex, race, and gender and age. And before I talk about that, I actually just want to want us to take a second to kind of examine how fast we have moved from the way we think about smoking. Just in the last couple of decades, when smoking was really prevalent and everywhere, and even high school kids were smoking, and it was all over the uh, newspapers and movies and magazines and in covers, and um, it happened really frequently, and it was very tolerable, and it happened in in all places of public accommodations. And just in the last 20 years or so, we have dramatically changed the way that we think about smoking. And that didn't happen because Americans started becoming um, researchers themselves and started uh, being mindful of that. It happened because we declared smoking a public health crisis and we committed resources to addressing smoking as a public health crisis. And the result of doing that was we now know how many people smoke by sex, race, gender, data. Uh, we have a lot of data around it, age. We know how many people have diseases and are dying from smoking. We know the healthcare costs that are associated with smoking. We can test how effective our strategies are in addressing it. Current smoking has declined from, declined from 20% in 2005 to 14% in 2019. 
That's a very short period of time. And the proportion of um, smokers have e uh, that have quit have even decreased significantly. Today, no one would deny that smoking causes cancer and that it is bad for your health. We all agree that it should not be glamorized or advertised to children. There is probably 100% consensus that as members of the public, we have the right to know when something impacts our health. And the smokers' rights were balanced against the public's right to clean air in restaurants, airplanes, and public places. And the tobacco industry was taxed to cover the real health costs of smoking. We insisted that its rights to profits did not entitle it to ignore that burden. So it is incredibly valuable to treat something as a public health crisis or a public health emergency. Who has declared racism a public health crisis? Well, the city of Burlington has. We know that more than 170 local and state leaders and public health entities have declared racism a public health crisis or emergency. I think the number is somewhere in the 90s in terms of uh, municipalities and states. Uh, recently, the CDC declared racism a serious public health threat and outlined specific steps that it's going to take to address it. And there's a very similar bill at the federal level uh, looking to formally identify systemic racism as a public health crisis in the United States. And it would mean committing resources to the Centers for Disease Control to prevent, develop, to prevent and develop health policies that specifically address racial disparities. So declaring racism a public health emergency really requires two fundamental beliefs, that racism exists and that racism is prevalent. And really it is everyone's job to address it where they live and work. And it really is time for all of us to invest in addressing that crisis that we have really created through years, probably 400 years worth of not just practice and policy, but very specific laws that created uh, racism and systemic racism and individual racism and implicit bias as well. So I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. <clears throat> Bor, I'm wondering, uh... I'm hoping that you can stay um, through both testimony um, and understand if you can. Um, but we've got we've got some questions right now. Representative Rosenquist. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, Bohr, thank you for coming this morning. And I was wondering when you were talking about the housing issue and that uh, government started building uh, housing in certain areas in the 1950s. It certainly wasn't the uh, purpose to segregate people. It so happened that people got segregated by the housing. Wouldn't you agree to that? I don't think they did it on purpose. It was on purpose. It was on purpose. There's, there's very good evidence that it was on purpose because it's written down. That remember, this is a different time of our lives now. And the government purposefully said, we will develop housing uh, in the suburbs, we will target white people to go live in the suburbs, and we will make sure that that those homes cannot be sold to black people. In fact, developers will not get money if they sell if they develop homes in black areas. And by the way, once we sell it to white people, we need to make sure that they can never sell it to black people. And so that the government sanctioned those conditions to make sure that those homes were never redone. And this is why this is important because oftentimes we think that racism is an individual problem, but there was good evidence that white people and black people had already started to live in integrated housing and that the government came in and said, oh no, no, you can't do that. That's not okay, that's not what we want. And so now we have these very specific historical decisions that were made by our government that I think now our government has an obligation to undo. 
and not just our government, but all of us. And that's why I think it's valuable to look at housing and education, because when I when I do trainings for educators, it's their job to address bias and discrimination, historical discrimination and present day discrimination in where they work. But it is the job of doctors and healthcare providers to address discrimination in the healthcare system. In fact, they're the most qualified people to address it. And that's why when we declare something a public health crisis, it says the government is saying, we did something to create racism. We're gonna undo it. And now we're gonna force our entities to address it. The people that have the most expertise to, to look at that. Um, so it's in that sense, it's really valuable because it says everybody has their hand in undoing racism. I hope that answered your question. Um, I think you're muted, Representative. Got this problem with the space bar didn't work, you know. Oh, Carl, Carl, we still can't hear you. Sorry, thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, and thank you for the answer. Uh, you know, I, I wasn't. I'll have to say I don't remember all the things you talked about happening, but I mean, obviously, you're more of an expert on this than I am as far as the history of it. Uh, it, it would seem to me we've come a long way from those days, though. We have very integrated communities today. It seems like in most areas, as far as I know. You, you probably would disagree, but it certainly appears that we have a lot more integration of uh, living conditions. Uh, I just, I also had another uh, question and that was, you spoke so much about the smoking as a parallel to look at and talk a lot about statistics. Do we have statistics on the smoking uh, level of different races uh, and uh, currently? Yes, we do. Yes, the CDC, because once smoking was declared a public health crisis, the CDC was able to devote resources to collecting that data, conducting investigations, analyzing and reporting that. And really it is that reporting that in fact has educated all of us in the last couple of uh, decades to go, whoa, smoking is disgusting. It is bad for our health. Now we have so much information. It's costly. Um, and these uh, tobacco companies are making billions of dollars and they have an obligation to tell us the truth and to address it. And I don't think that that would have happened if we hadn't declared smoking a public health crisis. Okay. I, I, uh specifically was interested in what are the smoking levels between, let's say, um, the black, uh, indigenous and white communities, if you will. Yeah, that's a great question. I don't have the specific statistics before, uh, before me. I would say that the answer to that question is not relevant necessarily. The comparison that I was making was not about different races and how they smoke, but that the there's a value in declaring racism a public health crisis, like there was in declaring smoking a public health crisis. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, Representative uh, Rosenquist, we can get the um, answer for you from the Department of um, You're breaking up, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, um, um, I, I was saying we can we can get the um, both what uh, uh, Bor, Bor Yang was saying, which is um, the comparison she was making was what you know what's the importance of identifying something as a public health crisis and what that then results in, um, and at the same time you had another question and we can get the answer we can get the the data that you're looking for as it relates to national. Thank you, Madam Chair. It, it, it won't be that necessary. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, Representative McFawn. Uh, 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thanks, Paul, for coming back. Um, I, I, I have a factual statement that I want to make. Um, you talked about uh, the housing and how the government segregated it uh, back in whatever uh, 60s or whenever you, whatever period of time. Um, I want to talk to you about a lived experience, okay? Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, and you can, if, if you want, you can do the research. There were tenements that were put up in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And the people that went into those tenements were white Irish Americans and people of color went into those tenements. And my recollection was there was never any government interference to try to segregate the people that went into those tenements. I have to say most of those people were people of low income and people that were probably, not probably, that were being discriminated against. So I just want you to, when, you, when you're making statements that the government uh, did this, um, my lived experience in Cambridge, Massachusetts, was that was not the case. Government did not get involved. The government was dying to get these people a place to live. And we lived together. We played baseball together. We went to the park that was right next to the tenements together all day long. I'm talking about the kids. So I just wanted you to know that. Uh, and I don't know how that stacks up with the, the information that you got from Harvard, because this place that I'm talking about is a stone's throw from Harvard Square. Um, the other thing that I wanted to bring up, um, I've gone through most of the whereas things with the, where you press on it and you get the information. Most of it is national information. Boy, I'm interested in nationally making sure we take care of things the way we should. No question about it. But I want to know what's going on in Vermont. And um, that's the kind of statistics that makes a huge difference with me. I think in Vermont, we have tried real hard. And to, to make sure that this is a healthy place to live for everybody. One question that I would like, I don't know whether you can answer it or not, Paul, but one of the statements that was made is people of color are more susceptible to getting COVID-19. Now, I, I would just like to know why that is happening. I'm not gonna debate whether it's happening, I want to know why. Do you know why? That's a great question. Thank you for asking that. And thank you for your statement too. Uh, what in one of the slides I mentioned that the Harvard uh, Medical School did some research and showed that people of color who were first line responders uh, were more likely to be um, tasked with serving people who had COVID and ha had less access or less opportunity to use um, gear that was protective. And they were most more likely to be infected by those patients as well. But the answer to your question about why these things exist is precisely the reason why we need to declare racism a public health crisis, because we don't have all of the answers. And when we declare something a public health crisis, we in fact create the language that we need to collect the data that we need. Now, if you need the data before you can agree to collect the data, then that puts us in this conundrum, right? Where we can then never access the information that we need. And 
I just want to say also that your question about being interested in what it looks like in Vermont, we have a lot of great data about what it looks like in Vermont in terms of racism in our school systems. We have data that tells us that kids with disabilities, LGBTQ kids, and uh, kids of color are more likely to be disciplined than other children. And that is really important data. We have data that shows us that housing discrimination is very prevalent. I shared some of that data with you. What we don't have in Vermont is a lot of data around health and healthcare. And that's why we need to declare, but hold on. That's why we need to declare racism a public health crisis. If you believe that racism is real and that it is prevalent in our schools, it is pre prevalent in our housing, it is prevalent in employment, then to suggest that, well, I need to know if it's prevalent in healthcare before I declare it doesn't make sense. Of course it is, but we need to declare that so that we can collect that data for the purposes of analysis. So it, I also am very invested in looking and seeing what that looks like in Vermont as well, not just nationally. Um, Dr. Richard Rothstein, wrote a book called The Color of Law. And it was a summary of his investigation into housing discrimination. And so I would just encourage those of you who might question whether the government has ever done anything intentionally to create housing segregation, to look at statistics and data and to look at that. And, and uh, again, it's, he's very well esteemed. He is uh, not even a person of color. He has done that investigation for us. He has looked at how we have strategically as a government created law specifically to segregate people and that the disparities that exist today is connected to those very strategic decisions that were made from the government. So I'm not here to deny anyone's lived or personal experiences around housing and housing discrimination. I would also just say that we can't deny the statistics. We can't deny the facts. Uh, we can't deny things that are written down in history. And he has done a really great job of showing that history to us in a very clear, almost mathematical way. So I would encourage you to, to, to read that. Uh, thank you, Bo. Uh, I'm not, uh, as I said before, I even opened my mouth when I first opened my mouth um, that I'm not denying it nationally. That's not an issue with me. I'm looking at Vermont. I represent people in Barrytown. And um, Representative McFawn, let me interrupt here for a second. We heard um, in terms of uh, your health questions and I didn't get it answered, Madam Chair. I'm sorry, what? I did not get it answered. Um, I've, I'm going to direct you to the testimony of the Commissioner of Health um, on this resolution um, on, um, I think it's April 8th. Um, and uh, we can go and there is a PowerPoint. <laughs> and in that PowerPoint has um, numbers and statistics that are from Vermont. Um, I, I know that we have been- I know the statistics are there, Madam Chair. I've read them. I asked- so, the that's, so, so you were asking about Vermont and these are about Vermont. Yeah, but it doesn't tell me why. Oh, the why. The question is why. Why are people of color at a greater risk of contacting COVID-19? Um, I don't there's another, um, um, Topper, again, I'm, uh, Representative McFawn, again, I'm going to suggest that you re-look at that PowerPoint okay. because there is a heading on that PowerPoint that says, what are some of the contributing factors that led to the disparities we see for BIPOC? Um, and, um, so it's right there. And, I will relook at it. And, and if it's Vermont related and not Harvard University or some other place outside of here, um, then fine. If Harvard University came in here and, and did the study 
then fine, I'm willing to look at it. And I'm and so good. Um, I encourage all of us to, and this, uh, this conversation has, um, I wanna thank our, um, our committee assistant, uh, Julie, Tucker, who puts things so well so that I and has taught me so that I can now find it. Um, but it is um, for anyone um, on committee, it is dated. Um, it's under documents. You can look on our webpage under documents um, um, by author and it's Mark Levine and it's April 8th. Thank you, Paul. Thank you again for coming in. Uh, Representative Small, then Representative Wood. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for, for coming in today. It is a pleasure to hear from you and to have your presentation. I think uh, from your last remark there about talking about the importance of declaring this, I think we saw this with the Department of Health when they also declared racism as a public health crisis and seeing that during COVID, they were able to create a health equity team that is now investigating the inequities, understanding that we didn't have translated materials for our various communities, especially here in my wonderful city of Winnipeg. Ski, um, and making those changes because of that declaration. So thank you for, for pointing to that. Um, my first question is, uh, I, I assume that you are in support of this resolution. And with that, why do you feel it's important that we name racism as, as the contributing factor as a public health crisis and emergency, rather than say economic disadvantages or economic inequities? That's a great question. And um, again, because we know from the data that we do have, both at the national and local level, that people of color are dying and have different mortality rates than people who are white. So it that doesn't necessarily mean that there aren't other protected categories of people that also probably need the same kind of levels of protection. But before us today is whether racism is the issue and absolutely it is and i just go back to we need we declare it so that we can collect the data so that we can report it and educate ourselves we cannot expect that we are educated first before we declare something it it's a it's a cyclical problem here uh if that's what we're requiring and we declare it because the people who are best fit to address racism as a public health crisis are people who in the public health field. If we don't do that, then it, it remains the burden of the Human Rights Commission, it remains the burden of other groups of people, community advocates, and so forth to address these issues. It is important that we are addressing racism in each of the field that we are the expert in, and that's why we have to do it. Um, and this is not something that radical. We have a lot of agencies and entities and municipalities that are doing this, including the CDC that has done this. And so, um, yeah, thank you. Can't hear you, a Representative Small. Oh, I knew it would happen sometime. Yay! Uh, thank you. So glad. Sorry. Uh, no, thank you. Uh, and thank you for, I was saying that we have also heard from personal stories of BIPOC Vermonters and understanding the difficulties in navigating health systems or so social determinants of health and, and being able to thrive here in the state. And so uh, my last question is, are there any edits that you would make to this resolution? That's a great question. Uh, no. None at all. Uh, no, I sort of leave that up to you all. I think yeah. it, it, making the resolution is the most important rather than the specific details of it. There are times when you're, it's beyond a resolution. It's a very specific statutory change that I do often weigh in on commas and semicolons and all of that stuff. But in terms of a resolution, I think the impact of it is much greater than the specific words and, and where they are, so. Wonderful, thank you so much. Thank you, and um, 
Representative Wood, you will be um, the last question or comment for um, Bor Yang, because we also have um, Case um, Long here, because um, as is uh, uh, what we do here in the legislature is we hear from people who um, have different uh, points of view. And I want to give um, a Case um, a, <clears throat> the amount of time that he needs and deserves to share his views. Um, Teresa, Representative Wood. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I think I'll be brief. Um, I, I guess um, one thing that I want to confirm, I want to make sure I interpreted what you said correctly, um, Board, was that in, in, uh, in giving the example that you gave, for instance, with smoking um, and its connection to health, that uh, all of those things that you listed um, in terms of the information we now have as a society um, uh, were gleaned after we made that declaration. I mean, we started collecting, it sounds like um, what I'm learning from you is that, that, um, that we now have as much information as we do about the health concerns with smoking because there was a, you know, essentially a declaration saying that it is bad for your health. And are you saying that uh, once we make a declaration um, about racism being a public health threat, that um, that that causes that there's a causation in terms of us collecting more information, us you know being um, when I say us, I, mean, I reference the healthcare professionals, but then you know the changes that happen in society, um, that we will have more information because it. Uh, uh, I guess that's my question. Yes. And, and really you have answered it because that's, that's absolutely right. When, we, when the government makes this kind of declaration, it says we validate that this is, racism is real, racism is prevalent, and that we need to assign the task of looking at it more closely to the people that who know how to look at it. And that's that's the value in making such a declaration. Now, there were some lawsuits that came about in terms of smoking that sort of made us realize that it was bad. But once the government declared that, it used resource, money and time and committed really people to doing that data collection, that investigation and that reporting. And that is what shifted the culture around it. That's mm -hmm. truly what, but those lawsuits probably would have changed the class action plaintiff's lives, but it wouldn't have been enough for all of us to change our thoughts and beliefs around smoking, mm -hmm. right? Like today, I think we, even if you know people who are smoking today, they would say, this is just, I don't want to do this anymore. They're all still looking to quit it. We have dramatically changed our culture around smoking. And so this is really about changing culture and climate around race too, and racism. And so, and to do that, we have to have these public ad campaigns. We have to have strategies. We have to have everybody on board doing that work where they live and where they work. And um, this to me is the step really in, in making sure that that happens. Thank you, Bor. And then, um, uh, not to not to disagree with my esteemed colleague from Barry Town, but um, I, I too am am uh, um, interested in having a declaration that uh, references Vermont data, and fifteen out of the twenty data points are Vermont data. It's not it's not a majority of national data. I just wanted that to sort of be on the record because people are listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, Bor, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> appreciate that. And uh, <clears throat> Case, welcome. Um, as you can see, we have lots of questions, even after um, there are uh, <clears throat> um, perhaps a beginning remarks. So I want to turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Madam Chair, may I just introduce him? Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So... Camilla Long is a fellow comrade in arms, 11-year uh, veteran of the Army National Guard, having served two combat tours in, in Afghanistan. He's the proud father of three daughters, a small business owner in Milton, Vermont, recently ran for the Senate from Chittenden County and 
currently is serving as a school board member in Milton School District. And so welcome, Kamulia. Thank you for the uh, introduction, uh, Representative uh, Rosenquist. And thank you, Madam Chair and the rest of the committee for having me here today. Um, I appreciate the invitation. Um, it's my intent today to um, present my testimony uh, more so in the form of questions um, in breaking down some of the sections uh, within the resolution. I know that I submitted a document that had some cliff notes, which also includes some minor spelling errors, which I apologize for. Um, I do know the difference between your and your. So, um, <laughs> um, so that being said, you know, uh, I do have some questions. Some things that are on that document are not going to be in uh, this testimony that I have here. I've had some time to do some additional research. I wish I had had access to Boar's presentation prior to uh, this testimony, but I do appreciate the information that she provided. So that being said, um, I'll just, I'll jump right in. Um, the sections I, I broke into um, the, uh, where the section starts with whereas would start a new section. Um, so section one, uh, which would be the title of the joint resolution relating to racism as a public health emergency. Uh, I researched this online. I found a lot of information on the CDC website. Uh, however, I do feel that the words uh, economic disparity or economic inequalities uh, would be a good substitute um, for language uh, in this particular title. Uh, I think it's important that we recognize that correlation does not always mean causation. And I think that's just something that we should take with us uh, as we look at the title um, for this resolution. Uh, as I go down to sections two and three, um, it mentions uh, health, inequality, excuse me, health inequalities exist in the United States based on race and that are caused by systemic racism. So my comment is, how are we defining health inequalities and what do the statistics say? The remainder of this resolution is riddled with statistics, yet this portion offers none. Also, the words systemic racism are used in this section and offer no clarity on how Vermont defines systemic racism. If systemic racism is important enough to write into a resolution that declares racism a public health emergency, then I feel that we would be remiss in not defining it so that, so as to anyone uh, specifically Vermonters reading the resolution understands what it is that the legislation is trying to uh, accomplish and exactly what it is that we're addressing. As we move to section four, it mentions black and Latino people in the United States have been nearly three times as likely to die. My question is, why are we using, uh, why are we using national data in this section? Why are we not using data from our own state? If racism in Vermont is a public health emergency, then we should provide Vermonters with real data as it pertains to our state. Are Black and Latino people more likely to die or are they dying at three times the rate? Are the deaths or likelihood of death related to COVID or racism? And I think that's a question that we have to ask ourselves before introducing it into a, uh, a resolution um, and then presenting it to the public. Uh, five, Black residents comprise just over 1% of Vermont's population. They account for approximately 4.8 of the total confirmed COVID cases. My question is why is the data only referencing the black population? Why are we not using data from all non-white Vermonters? Would this statistic present a less ominous, uh, excuse me, would it present as less ominous if we included all non-white Vermonters? I feel leaving ethnic groups out of the statistic depicts an inaccurate narrative. If we look at the data in terms of household, would the percent of population to the percent of confirmed cases be closer to a one-to-one -one ratio? And I think that's, again, that's something else that we should consider as we write it into the uh, resolution. It's important that we present an accurate narrative to Vermonters so that we understand what it is that, again, what the, legislative is, well, what the legislature is trying to accomplish. Section six. Uh, Vermont residents experience barriers to equal enjoyment of good health based on race and ethnicity. So is this in reference to all Vermonters or only non-white Vermonters? What are the barriers in Vermont that prevent equal enjoyment of good health based on race and ethnicity? Is there data to support this statement? Is this due to racism or can this be attributed to economic disparities and inequalities? 
And as I read this, I understand that board presented some information that would answer some of this question. However, I think that it's, again, we would be remiss if we didn't revisit these questions and ask them before presenting it in this resolution. Seven uh, talks about COVID incidence rate and non-white Vermonters. I appreciate that this section includes data from other ethnic groups. However, what does the statistic look like if we look at the incident rate, incidence rate by household? What is the incidence rate versus death rate versus hospitalization rate? Also, is the disparity due to racism or would it be better characterized as an economic this or uh, an economic disparity or inequality. And again, I feel it's important for us to provide an accurate narrative as it pertains to Vermont. Section nine, 30% of non-white Vermonters had household contact with a confirmed case of COVID as compared to only 20% of white Vermonters. My question is, does this statement take into consideration the household size? Can this disparity be attributed to cultural differences between white and non-white Vermonters and the propensity for multi-generational non-white Vermonters. And I believe that this is something that we need to take into consideration when presenting this data so that we're not presenting a skewed, um, um, a skewed version of what is actually going on. Number 13, 21% of black Vermonters own homes <clears throat> while 72% of white Vermonters own their own homes. So <laughs> this section should include all non-white Vermonters, not just black. And um, that's something that I see throughout this resolution and just overall. So as we talk about racism, I believe it's important that we talk about racism and be inclusive, right? So black people are not the only people who experience racism and black people are not the only ethnic group that um, make up the diverse population. Um, of Vermont. So we, again, we would be, we are remiss in leaving out other ethnic groups. And when we only specific um, focus on one, uh, um, on some level, we're disrespecting the, uh, the other groups that, uh, that we would consider a uh, part of a demographic here in Vermont. <sighs> okay. Um, so my question uh, still on 13 is uh, how many non-white Vermonters want to own homes? And is this parameter defined in a similar fashion as unemployment in that if you are not looking for work, then you are technically not employed. So if non-white Vermonters want to buy and can't, is that due to racism or is that, or can that be attributed to economic disparities and inequalities um, based on the cost of living here in Vermont? And I, I understand that that's a different conversation, but again, it's a question that we have to ask um, and specifically regarding, is it because they are unable or they don't want to? As we get into 14, talks about the median household income of black Vermonters versus the median income of white Vermonters. And again, um, I believe this would read better if, we, if it referenced non-white Vermonters versus white Vermonters and even still, um, are we saying that the difference in the median pay is due to racism? And if not, then how is this statement relevant? I believe that this section would better support a resolution that states economic inequity as a public health emergency. Um, however, I'd also hesitate to leave the section in this resolution. I personally feel um, it's disrespectful to discuss differences in income and leave out the pay gap as it, uh, as it pertains to, to women. And that's, I'll leave it at that. <clears throat> Number 16, one in two white Vermonters experience housing problems, which is defined as having homes that lack complete faci uh, kitchen facilities or plumbing, having overcrowded homes, or paying more than 30% of household income towards rent, mortgage payments, and utilities. So this section does not contain a comparison to non or excuse me, to white Vermonters. And I'm wondering why that is. Other sections within this resolution uh, are clear about making a comparison between white and non-white or white and black. However, in here, we're not seeing a comparison to the, what our white counterparts. Uh, are the housing problems due to racism? Or again, are they due to economic disparities or inequities? Number 17, 
Black Vermonters are overrepresented among Vermonters experiencing homelessness in that they make up 6% of Vermonters experiencing homelessness while making up approximately 1% of Vermont's population. Again, this section does not contain a comparison to white Vermonters as a, as a percentage of population. Um, and additionally, we are again, excuse me, we're again only looking at the statistic for black Vermonters as opposed to non-white Vermonters. And then lastly, uh, number 18, racism constitutes a public health emergency. My question is, is racism truly a health, a public health emergency in Vermont? Or can this be attributed to economic disparities and inequities? So those are my questions uh, or opinions uh, in regards to this resolution. I speak um, as a Vermonter, as a citizen of Chittenden County, and I do not represent um, my, uh, I do not speak for any particular group other than myself. Um, so I, if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them um, at this time. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Case. Thank you. And I thank you for um, the, the closeness with which you uh, took a critical eye to this um, resolution. Uh, you started, I guess I have a question for you. You started your uh, your first comment, joint resolution relating to racism, your first um, sort of comment was, um, I, I, was, I disagree. I could get behind economic inequality or economic disparities. So I guess my question to, to you as an individual um, is um, whether or not um, the the underlying philosophical or um, value um, or perspective that racism is a given, that racism and sy systemic racism exists and exists in Vermont. Um, do you, is that something that you disagree with? And so that, is that the import of, of um, a lot of your questions? Um. <clears throat> So when I look at this document, I just, I look at it from a data standpoint and pre the presentation of that data. Um, I was an analyst uh, with the military, so I thoroughly enjoyed numbers. And, um, <laughs> looking at data, understanding the data and, you know, and presenting a narrative. I do believe racism is, um, is a problem. It is absolutely mm -hmm. a problem. It exists everywhere. And we can, we can go back a hundred years, we can go back a thousand years, but it will always be there. So how far back do we go to say that this is going to be the root cause, right? So I feel as though we are looking to tackle an issue that will never go away. I feel as though human, the human race will always find something that we can, that we can fight over. So whether it's race, whether it's gender, and we can, le we can legitimately go down a long list. And I feel like these things will, will constantly be issues. However, if we can address economic inequality, then we can help, um, I would say, a much bigger group of individuals, right? And in that, we can help lift each other up. And through education, yes, we can absolutely address uh, racism to agree, but really what we're looking at doing is we're trying to change the mindset of people who don't even fully understand why they have the mindset that they have. Um, I, thank did you. I, and did I answer your question? Um, no, <laughs> um, no, no, you know, okay. Casey, you, did, okay. um, you absolutely did. And, um, I have to remember that sitting in this seat right now, um, I am the chair of a committee you and I are not having a conversation over coffee, nor are we having an academic, I, in my other life I teach, um, nor are we having a, an academic um, discussion. And I need to um, 
listen, it's important for me to listen and try to understand what you are saying um, and the point you are trying to make, um, which is a, which I'm still trying to understand. Okay. Um, and as other people ask questions and comments, that may help my understanding as well. Okay. Um, I believe we have Representative Redmond and then Representative Wood. Thanks, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you very much for being here. Appreciate your testimony. Um, I wanted to um, ask a question about, um, you made a point that um, there continues in the resolution to be an emphasis or, or a, a mentioning of data around Black Vermonters, and that you know you you have issue with the fact that other non-white or white Vermonters are not um, mentioned, at, you know, in data points. And I, I'm guessing I don't know the auspices of the resolution and, and where all the data came, but I'm guessing that. Um, Th that black Vermonters, the data points on black Vermonters were pulled out because they were particularly dramatic um, relative to the, the population in the state. And I'm, I guess I'm wondering um, why that's probably, you know, why that's problematic, because I think it is important to shine a light on people who you know, seem to be suffering uh, challenges or difficulties greater than another group, for example. Um, so that's kind of one question, why that's an issue. And then, um, and then I have one other quick question I wanna ask as well, so. Okay. Oh, sorry, is it my turn? No, I was, no. Uh, yeah, um, I, I should let you answer, but my committee knows that I have to interrupt. Um, Mary Beth, uh, Representative Redmond, I'm the comment that I'm going to make as a non-researcher is that oftentimes data is not identified. And that is something that actually Dr. Levine talked about a lot um, in his weekly things. Sometimes we do um, data is not reported because the numbers are too small for them to be um, statistically relevant or mm -hmm. um, specific data is not reported because in a place like Vermont, um, it would be giving out information that is too personal because we would be able to identify. Um, now, um, now, Case, please answer <laughs> Representative Red. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. Um, so I guess I find it, um, I don't know that offensive is the word that I want to use, but as we sit and we talk about, um, you know, equality and we talk about, again, racism, racism isn't just a black white issue. And there are so many other isms that would also need to be addressed that could, um, could be contributing factors to where we are now. But if we are going to talk about race, we can't just talk about black people and white people. We have to talk about and unfortunately, when we talk about racism, it has to do with, we're it seems more often than not, we're talking about white people against non-white people. And we know that racism exists within the non-white population. So it's, even, it's, it's frustrating to even have to say it this way. So I believe that as we look at racism, uh, white versus non-white, that we need to include that data so that we present an accurate picture. So if the data, if, if the data says that we're 10 times likely, that, that is great. That is great data Then we can drive forward on that and then we can make decisions and, and use that information to drive the decisions that we make as we move forward. But if we're making decisions on data that is inconclusive or that is skewed or isn't presented um, in a way that's accurate, then that, that slight change here, that, that little, that, that half a degree turn here translates to something much bigger as we move 300, 400, 1,000 meters down the road, right? So I think that, again, I'm, I like data, and I think that it's important that we include all of those groups so that they don't feel excluded so that, well, you know, so that it's not, oh, well, this is just a black-white issue when, you know, uh, 
there are other ethnic groups that are experiencing um, difficulties in experiencing racism. Mm -hmm. I, I, does that answer your question? No, I appreciate that. Okay. I appreciate that perspective. That that helps. Yeah. Um, and then I guess my other question is: you you know you you're using the terms economic disparity and economic in inequality, which mm -hmm. you know are really important terms and are accurate for the experience of a lot you know numbers of Vermonters. Um, I'm, it kind of goes to Madam Chair's point, which is, you know, do you feel that underneath those disparities that there are roots and systems in place that don't offer that equal, you know, opportunity to everyone? I mean, it's it sounds like that's problematic for you. So I'm just curious, you know, what your thought, I mean, I, I guess I, I feel that there are, there are systemic things that, that provide opportunities for some and take away opportunities for others. And I'm, I'm guessing that that um, is a, that would be a challenging view for you. So I'm just wanting to really understand kind of what you think is below those disparities and in inequities. I could understand, um, I could understand um, someone's viewpoint if they were going to say that racism is the foundation for all of these things that are taking place. But then I go back to, well, is it truly the foundation? Well, then what comes before racism? And is that the thing that we should address? So how far back do we go? How mm -hmm. far back do we place um, blame or um, assign responsibility um, before we get here? Right. So I guess that, that would be, um, mm. Um, where I stand on that in regards to systemic racism, again, as I had mentioned, I think it's important that we define what we mean by systemic racism, because honestly, I don't feel that everyone has the same understanding of what it is. My understanding is that these are systems or organizations in place that, um, that perpetuate racism or yeah, that, that perpetuate racism. So I guess I would challenge, uh, my question is, are we saying that there's racism within the healthcare system? Is there systemic racism there? And if so, then why is it not being addressed? You know, is it, are there policies? Are there policies that saying that people of color, you, you, you know, you can't get the healthcare that you need? Um, or is it, they can't afford to get the healthcare care that they need? Or are we talking about the people who are in pos uh, decision-making positions? Are they the individuals that, pos that possess the racist mindset that are preventing the people of color from moving around the organization or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. So, so what is it? Are they systems and policies or are they people that we have in, in power? And because we have to address those in two different ways, right? So we really have to, we have to find where the problem is. We have to fixate on it. We have to target it, locate it, find out exactly what it is. We have to, we have to go in, we have to eradicate it, exploit the data, analyze the data, and then move on and, and just, and start the process again to help us identify, you know, these other systems and processes within, a, um, within an organization or within a system, you know, if that is actually the case. Hmm. So I guess when I think systemic racism, I think of the redlining and, you know, the black laws and the separate but equal. And I think about all of those things. And I, I believe that we've come a long way to get rid of a lot of those things. And while there may be some type of undertone i don't believe that it's blatant and i think the thing that we're chasing i wonder if we would be better to chase economic disparities and inequalities and that's just my question and i that's the question that i pose to you and that's the, it's the one that i would pose to anyone my personal experience as a person of color is very different than i would say um others within the state of vermont Thank you. Did, did I answer your question? I tend to ramble. Yes, so, yes okay. that was very helpful. That was okay. very helpful. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. You fit right right in, in our committee. <laughs> um, Representative Wood. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, thank you, Camelia, for, for um, you've given me um, a lot to think about um, in this resolution. And um, I, I've really been listening to your responses to Representative Redman and Representative Pugh because it, my sort of 
question in my in my head is still around this this concept of economic disparity, um, uh, not versus racism, but sort of is versus racism in terms of this resolution. And it it feels to me like a, a chicken and an egg thing. It feels like a bit of a circular argument. Um, uh, and I appreciate your comment about um, you know causation at the beginning of your comments and. Um, so I guess this is really not a question after all, but uh, I'm still struggling with the with the feels like to me a circular argument around economic disparity and race. And I agree with you that 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 also applies to other populations. And uh, maybe next year we're going to have a resolution that references, you know, women um, in, in terms of uh, their economic disparities and access to healthcare and all of those kinds of things. Um, but I'm, I'm trying to figure out what disadvantage, what disadvantage is there to naming race as an issue for um, proper public health? That's a good question. I wasn't prepared for that question. <laughs> um, well, you can think about it if you want and come back sure. to it. Um, sure. Um, so I don't, um, I can't say one way or the other. I feel, I feel words are important. And I, and I, as a citizen, when I hear racism is a public health emergency, as someone who has experienced racism, I don't see it as a public health emergency. I see COVID as a public health emergency, right? I see pandemics and uh, epidemics as public health emergencies. And I understand that we're defining, we're finding different ways to define what a public health emergency is. My, my concern is that we're reaching and going to racism as a public health emergency. But uh, you know, um, going to what Bohr had mentioned earlier in her presentation, having to name racism as a public health emergency will allow us to then do the research and collect the data. Um, and um, I understand that. I don't believe it's the right way to go. I, and with the analogy between, or um, the, I'm sorry, the comparison between racism and uh, uh, as a public health emergency and smoking as a public health emergency, I don't know that we needed to declare it as a public health emergency to find out that smoking is bad and does bad things. I don't know that that's the case. However, I am not a medical professional and I'm not here speaking as one. I'm just speaking as a citizen. And I feel as though if I were to go down to Hannaford's and have a similar conversation with a citizen, their response would be very similar. So I think it's important that we choose our words carefully. And the words that we do choose that we offer definitions if there's any ambiguity, like systemic racism, um, and what constitutes a public health emergency. Does that, did that answer your question? It, no, I, I really appreciate you sharing your perspectives. Um, okay. it, it really is helpful um, to understand the, the um, you know, variety of thinking around around this issue and around this resolution. And okay. um, so I, I really, really appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Rosenquist. Thank you, Madam Chair. My concern, as I've expressed before, is that the term racism is a connotative word that carries a lot of extra baggage and unfortunately divides us. I know um, a famous movie star once said, when asked about the, how can we reduce racism? And he said, stop talking about it. And that was Morgan Freeman. And uh, I, in many ways, that's my, one of my concerns here is we're focusing on something called racism, which I, I think many of us have, don't really know. And as uh, Kamulia said, maybe it's something's gonna be with us forever. Uh, and instead of concentrating on the outcomes, and some of them may be outcomes of racism, but some of the outcomes that are talked about in this resolution are not just racial, ethnic, 
cultural and I would say circumstantial disparities. Uh, and what I mean by circumstantial is new immigrants to this country many times will live in congregate settings. Um, my family, when they came here from Sweden, um, my, my mom and dad, they had my father's mother living with them. They had uh, one of his uncles and well, not one of his uncles, one of his brothers and one of his sisters living with them. And then they actually brought over another brother from the Philippines and his entire family and they lived with us. This was just about the time I was born. Uh, so I don't remember too much about it, but my one uncle who had served in the trenches in France, he lived with us for the rest of his life, uh, and I remember that very well. So I, I just think that sometimes, and uh, coming back to Camulia's use of the term uh, causality, okay, in other words, we, we really do need to understand the cause is may not some be racism. There are a whole lot of other contributing factors to some of these is issues. And one of the greatest ones, I mean, we know that uh, right now, Winooski is sort of a melting pot of our state and a lot of cultural diversity. There's no two ways about it. I, I owned an apartment house in, in Winooski for 10 years and uh, experienced a lot of those things. And uh, the and it was quite beautiful. I'm walking down the street and in, in uh, Winooski is quite an experience sometimes, the different dress and, uh, that people wear and different things like that. So anyway, I just wanted to make that point that, as you know, that's one of my biggest problems on this, that using the term racism instead of dwelling on the outcomes and dwelling with them as a public health emergency or whatever uh, divides us and I, I think takes us away from the real solutions to the problem. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, you know, in that, and, and not to piggyback, but it just makes me think again, um, how, how deep of a problem is that within Vermont and would we accomplish more if we address the economic inequalities in lifting Vermonters up? Would we accomplish more? you know, through, you know, um, you know, education, training, jobs. And if we're lifting, if we're lifting each other up, it's not based on racism, just lifting people up. We're going to affect a much larger demographic. And I, I, I think it's something that we need to consider. It doesn't have to just be race. It can't always be race. And, and I, I remember Morgan Freeman saying that, and, you know, there on on some level, I want to say that, but then I also realize that it's not the right answer because it uh, it never really gets addressed, especially for those um, you know that that are genuinely having a deep struggle with experiencing racism. So on some level, yes, we do need to to talk about it, but it it doesn't have to be the root cause of all things bad, right? We need to address that. We need to we need to. If it is, and that is the case, then let's label it as such. Again, let's make sure, just make sure that we're using accurate data and that we're using our words and just using the, the appropriate words to address what it is that we wanna say. I hope that helps. Sorry, I, I know you had a question more. Um, case, um, case, thank you very much. Um, we have, um, uh, one short question from Dane, because um, then we are um, wrapping up with a final comment. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, thank you, Case, for being here and your testimony and raising your questions. Um, I guess one point, kind of going back to Teresa's point of um, chicken or egg kind of thing, Board mentioned that um, income uh, is, uh, you know, 60% uh, black income is 60% of white income. Um, black wealth is five to 7% of white wealth. Um, so is addressing racism in a way addressing economic inequality? And if you only address economic inequality and not racism, then how do you change those disparities? 
uh, are we talking about disparities in race or disparities in, in finance and, or in economics? So, uh, it, so um, if we address racism, yes, I believe that we can address some of these other uh, disparities that we're talking about. However, if we address um, the actual disparities themselves, I feel like we may get um, a much, uh, we, we'll get more movement in the direction of, of again, pulling people up. And in that, um, addressing some of the other, um, maybe uh, peripheral related uh, items. Again, just making sure, like, the data is extremely important and we have to understand why we're doing what we're doing. And we don't want to make a knee jerk reaction in jumping to something and, and, and calling it racism if that's not in fact what's going on. Because as I look through the resolution, the data, there is data here, but what it's not presenting me is with a uniform picture of what is going on in Vermont, which, which, make, which makes me very suspicious about the information that's in here. And that's not to say that, that, um, that the, the resolution or the data in itself is in fact suspicious, but it gives me that feeling because it goes from national to state to black to white. And sometimes we talk about other ethnicities and sometimes we don't. Sometimes we make a comparison with, um, with white and sometimes we don't. So it's, I would feel better about the resolution if the, if the, if the, if the information was presented in a more uniform way. Thank oh, you. So, oh, you're on the other side of the screen now. Sorry, okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank, uh, thank you for your question, Representative. Um, and Case, thank you. Thank you for really being part of, part of this discussion and Representative Rosenquist, um, I really thank you for um, uh, introducing um, Mr. Long to us all. Um, and uh, thank you very much. Um, I believe that um, I, I'd like to as, uh, uh, offer um, some additional comments from um, Boryang um, and then committee. Um, we are, uh, we will be taking a break, a short break after. So, um, Boryang, you will have uh, your, um, the, the final comment. What an honor. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to say that we cannot group everyone into the same group as if all of our experiences are the same. It is fundamentally unfair to suggest that 400 years of oppression against black people does not make their experience any different from all poor people in general. There is not a shortage of laws that protect women or protect people who are economically disadvantaged. In fact, if you take a look at a lot of our bills, those are the ones that often get picked up. We know as a matter of fact, that black and brown children are more likely to experience economic disparities be stopped by the police, be disciplined in schools. Yes, all women face discrimination in the workplace. Black women face discrimination in the workplace at a much greater rate than white women do. All trans people experience discrimination and harassment and hate crimes. Black trans women are more likely to be killed than white trans women. Being Black in America is fundamentally different than being any other person. And I am an Asian American, an immigrant, a refugee, a person with a disability. I also have identified myself as being someone who has been economically disadvantaged for probably the majority of my life. That does not mean that I understand or know what it's like to be Black. It is very different. And all of the disparities that we know to be true impact black and brown children at a very alarming and disparate rate than it does any other children. This joint resolution does not dictate what the work will look like or what the work will be or the data that needs to be collected or the strategies that needs to be utilized to address disparities. This is not a statute. It's, uh, it's, it's a hope, it's guidance. Um, 
and expecting that we should have un a uniform picture of what the data looks like in Vermont before we've even declared it a problem to collect that data is problematic. I think, and I, I don't think I'm incorrect in saying this, that even the Department of Health in Vermont only recently started collecting this information. Okay, so to suggest that we don't have the data to support a resolution is just disingenuous because we need the resolution to for the government to force the agencies and the departments to collect that data and to provide us that information. So I would encourage you to pass the resolution. I am not offended that uh, by any of the language that appears in the resolution. It is not dictation of what the work ought to look like and will look like. That work will be done by the people who are experts in this area. And I would encourage you to pass it quickly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bohr, and thank you, Case. And um, Bohr, if I can just say, um, our, our committee doesn't do anything quickly. Um, so I appreciate you would like us, um, because one of the hallmarks of our committee is in fact bringing in um, uh, opposing or um, alternate um, ways of looking um, at, the, at what is before us. Um, and um, I want to say today and this morning, I think, is a, um, a, um, a really good indication of um, the way that we need to do our work is to hear all of um, that. Um, and um, I would say, I think I speak for my, you know, um, and how it will look, I don't know, but to pass this resolution um, ultimately. Um, but listening to uh, all of the other, um, uh, um, all of the perspectives um, with that. And um, so I really respect and, um, Thank both of you, um, Case and Bohr, for um, really engaging with us for so long this morning. And uh, Representative Rosenquist, I am trying as chair to finish and wrap us up. Do you really need to make a last comment? Thank you. Um, so thank you very much, um, both of you. And uh, this um, ends this morning's session on um, the resolution. We will be taking a five minute break. Uh, now we'll, we'll be taking a 10 minute break and then as a committee, we will come back to um, uh, a whole different subject, which also has very um, some different